On behalf of the Build Corp Foundation, I'm excited to announce our new patron, General Sir Peter Cosgrove, a highly decorated Defence Force Chief and former Governor General of Australia. Sir Peter's leadership in the Army, Government and Community is both an inspiration and a lesson for us all in diplomacy, courage and empathy. We were honoured to have recently had the opportunity to host Sir Peter in a conversation on the topic of leadership, alongside another valued friend of the Foundation, John Brogdon. We all know John as a passionate national mental health and suicide prevention advocate, CEO of Lancome, patron of Lifeline Australia and president of Lifeline International. But before we get to the recording, I first wanted to give you, our supporters, an update on the impact you have helped us make. It's not often that we get the chance to see the true power of a collective giving community by doing less. But this is exactly what the last year revealed about our Build Corp Foundation community. Despite our annual fundraising events like the party and site barbecues unable to go ahead, we were heartened to see so many partners come forward and donate and help us fundraise in their own way. We're incredibly grateful for these partners who continue to join us on our ongoing mission to tackle the spectrum of our mental health crisis. The total funds raised for the Foundation in the last financial year, even without our events, reached over $223,000. This is thanks to the many long-standing individual donors, a fundraising event from Club Hibernia, a workplace giving program, as well as initiatives on BuildCorp sites supported by our project partners. The Foundation is proud to provide our supporters with the opportunity for exponential impact for their contributions whether it's through our own dollar match donations or that of our partners, as was the case with the New South Wales Government for the Smiling Mind Schools program. This year, an independent report by PwC revealed encouraging results from the New South Wales cohort of the Smiling Mind Schools program, which reached 445 schools. A vast majority of teachers observed significant wellbeing benefits in both themselves and the students. In 2021, we also donated a further $200,000 to Lifeline's crisis support services. This annual commitment to Lifeline enables our supporters to positively impact the lives of 100 people each week who access Lifeline's vital support channels. And whilst the Foundation's impact increased over last year, sadly, the mental wellbeing of our nation continued to be challenged by the pandemic and environmental concerns. And this has made us even more determined to continue our mission to invest in both preventative and crisis mental health initiatives to help make a difference now and in the future. Now we'll go to the interview with Sir Peter Cosgrove and John Brogdon. We hope you enjoy this conversation and gain some insights for your own leadership journey. Well, welcome to the first Friends of the Foundation event series. Uh, this is number one of a series for us where we would like to discuss with Friends of the Foundation matters of leadership, um, community and good mental health. So thank you very much for your time today, Sir Peter and John. Um, we are very keen to understand from each of you your different perspectives as eminent Australian leaders as to how leadership might look in a post-COVID Australia where all of us have been intellectually, financially, emotionally challenged and how each of us as Australians might be able to move our, ourselves and our communities and our businesses forward in a post-COVID world to ensure um, we thrive. So as two respected leaders um, and particularly as friends of the foundation as we say, John we've lent on you heavily since our inception as, of the Build Corp Foundation as to what leadership looks like in business and how each of us who at some stage in our lives are all going to be challenged mm. with um, emotional, physical, social health issues, um, how we might continue to um, show some resilience, dust ourselves off in a way that has allowed you to continue on as a leader of our community and the generosity of you know sharing your stories and leading and guiding us to be able to uh, do that ourselves. So maybe if I start with you, John, um, can you give us a little bit first of all about the landscape now, yeah. in post COVID Australia, and what you've seen as, as patron of Lifeline Australia sure. and chair, and I have to say president of Lifeline <laughs> International. Congratulations. Thank you. you. Look, I, I think there's never been a more important time to stay in touch with your people. 
never more important time to stay in touch with your people. Uh, and the benefit of things like Zoom and, is it's easier to stay in touch with them. Challenging for workforces like yours where people are on the tools, um, how do you get that contact? Much easier where people are on their bum in front of a computer all day. Um, the other thing that I, I think is very important is the concept of resilience. We should allow people to have a bad day. Mm. So I think we're on a risk sometimes when we push people to be resilient all the time that you know they think they can't fall over. Um, so the thing is, if they do fall over, you're there to pick them up again. Mm. So it's been an interesting time and it's been a great opportunity for leaders and employers in particular to demonstrate how much they care for their staff mm. and how much they want them to get through this, not just in the office, but home as well. And, you know, as somebody who kept his job during COVID, um, like most people, uh, I know others didn't keep their job. Mm. Uh, and in a mental health sense, the biggest challenge I think we'll have is um, this won't stop when we're at 95% double vax in terms of the mental health pressures. Mm. To give you an example, it's coming up to two years since we had those horrendous bushfires. Mm. We're still getting four to 500 calls a day from people affected by the bushfires because people experience trauma in different ways and at different times. So we can't just think everything will be right in a mental health and a, and a resilience perspective when we get to um, double vax in Australia because people miss their mother's funeral. Mm. They, weren't be, they weren't at their father's deathbed. Mm. Um, so people lost their job, many of them will get them back. But for some people, they, they missed incredibly important life experiences that they'll never get back. So we need to keep an eye on people's mental health as we move forward. And that's about staying in contact as much as possible. With each other. Sir Peter, we've been challenged as Australians and are trying to recover from COVID and rebuild our community. And a lot of us have had our resilience eroded a bit. And I know you've had and led troops overseas on behalf of this nation who have seen things and heard things that they can't unsee and can't unhear. I wonder if you might have any thoughts that you could share with us that we might be able to more broadly apply to our journeys. Well, uh let me start by saying this is my, my first words as patron of the foundation. I'm thrilled to be associated with the wonderful work of the foundation and Bill Corp and delighted that uh, Lifeline is one of the great beneficiaries of the, this philanthropy. Back to your question. Well, I'd like to uh, agree with everything uh, that John has said about some of the uh, observations of the impact of COVID on the community. There's another impact I could refer to as Governor General, previous Governor General, and that is I'm rather proud of the way in which the Australian community at large rallied around, the way they accepted the obligation we have as families, as neighbourhoods, as small communities to the major Australian community, looking out for each other, accepting the restrictions and the inhibitions so that we might all be safe and the more vulnerable amongst us uh, could be uh, kept safe or treated quickly once illness was apparent. I, I think in some ways this will be looked back on by the present day community as being the, the making or, or the memory of the moment where we stood up for each other as a community and came out the far end. It's almost a, a love thy neighbour outcome, which the country by and large embraced. Uh, we made some mistakes, but that part was not a mistake when Australians stood up for each other. Uh, and th th we still need to minister to those in need, but we can be proud of the way we operated as a nation. Sometimes it can feel quite disempowering when we understand we're in the middle of a mental health crisis which the nation is in and we individually know that um, we're just struggling to keep our own heads above water and often I'll ask John to just give us a couple of ideas of what we might be able to do as individuals to not just help ourselves but our communities and our, our, our neighbours and how important some of those little gestures are. It's yeah. just you know the cup of tea is as important as the, and, and some thinking around that. Tony and I worry about our staff because we have a very, our workforce is very spread across construction sites, not just 
across Sydney but across the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. And within our workforces there are, there's also a huge subcontract yes. uh, workforce as well. So on our sites we have a lot of largely men because we still attract more men but this business of our men feeling they have permission to reach out for help when they do, yeah. learning how to identify the signs in our friends and how we begin to, sh um, it's social change, I recognise what we're asking for, th this piece of permission and um, how we might begin that journey. Mm. Um, John? Well, you walk the talk here at Bill Cook, you do, in mm. terms of what you do and your barbecues and you know all those things mm. you've done for years in terms of bringing staff together. So congratulations and thank you for that. Look at, once again, it's about staying in touch with people. Mm. It's um, little things. So during COVID, um, w when we'd be having meetings, I'd ask people to come online physically, you know, get mm. off the, because uh, you need to see people's faces because mm. they'll often give away they're not doing well or whatever mm. it might be because you don't sit in a meeting with your face covered in, in, in this sort of face-to-face yeah, -face right, environment. Actually. So come on, mm. come online, come on visually to see how you are. They're important to check in with people. Um, the old offline conversation that you don't have because you're not in the office together, you, you can recreate that uh, and that's quite important. I guess the biggest thing I'd say, Josephine, is you know we're very good about asking how people are we've got Are You OK Day. Mm. We're also very good at saying, yeah, I'm OK. <laughs> yeah. And batting it away. And you do have to ask, particularly if you ride two and three times, you, have, you do keep asking to find out if somebody's OK. And um, the good thing about living in Australia in 2021 is we're much better than we used to mm. in terms of how we talk about these things and how we'll open up to other people. So, uh, and you know, not everything solved as it used to be by going to the beer for a pub, going to the pub for a beer or, you know, mm. going to the mm. movies or going shopping. So mm. we're, we're getting better at seriously dealing with those sorts of things and helping people. And um, as you said, just giving somebody a call. You know, you, everyone's got a bit of time in the day. You're in the car, you're going from A to B, you're walking. Give somebody a buzz. You know, you, you could make their day by having a five-minute conversation, and mm. we find this through Lifeline. For many people, we are the only voice they talk with yeah. all day. A um, lot of loneliness out there, a lot of loneliness out there, and you can break through that with a simple conversation mm. or a yell over the backyard. Everything that's old is new again. Yeah. <laughs> all that great stuff that, that yeah. we had as a society, that it worked, mm. you know, and it'll work again. It's worked, it's worked in the last two years. And we seem to have put distance between the aspirations of you know us to be leaders in our community, but you keep that really tight with what you do. You lead with empathy, John. And Sir Peter, I've heard you speak about this before. Um, you can't be a leader without empathy. You can, you can certainly be some kind of a despot because uh, <laughs> the laws of the mm. land put in authority over mm. other people mm. uh, in your hands. Uh, but it's the last refuge of a scoundrel to say, as leader, do it because the law says you have to do as I tell you. So there's an enormous amount of time we spend as we get to be more senior in uh, developing a way of rapport mm. and not just uh, inventing it, but practicing it, getting with your people to a point where they want to talk to you. Mm. Uh, and you, you, you like a... Uh, uh, almost like a travelling salesman. If I was visiting our troops on patrol on a Navy ship in the uh, Arabian Gulf, mm. they'd never have seen me before. This is some army general who's a CDF. And, they, and they'd, uh, they'd have heard of me, but what's he really like? Mm. So you spend time uh, with them to the point where they want to talk to you. And you, you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Amazing things come to pass. You worry the soul case out of the people in between. What did he say? Yeah. <laughs> what? But uh, that rubs off too. You want your people to be hard-nosed practitioners of our national security. Mm. But the other side of them has to be as real living human beings, imperfect themselves, knowing that, and looking to uplift. Well, you can't be one without the other. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I mean, you can't be one without the other. If, if you are simply a, uh, a despot or a tyrant, uh, your leadership might seem sound. Your followership will resemble the letter zero, the number zero. Mm. People need want to follow you, mm. and they'll only do it if they empathise with you and you with them. I guess that probably is the 
true definition of leadership, isn't it, really, where people want to follow you and you can genuinely influence, yep. change, influence the yep. way people think. Yep. I, I, I used to love a quote from General Patton, George, mm. George S. Patton, Jr., which was, you're never cold in front of your troops, you're never tired in front of your troops, you're never yep. hungry in front of your yep. troops. And I've learned that actually it is good if they know you're hungry, right? Yeah. So, you know, there was that, you're, you're bulletproof, you're absolutely bulletproof, but if they know you too are cold, it, it maybe connects you better than, I don't yeah. know, what do you think about that? I, I think it's okay to say that, but it's always got to have on the end of it, but we'll get on with it. Yeah. We'll yeah. get through this. Yes. Yeah, we're all cold. Um, and the, the yeah, we're all hungry. Uh, yeah. Yes, I agree. This is the worst job we've ever had. <laughs> yeah. But I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, so, it, uh, I remember when we were in his Timor, and uh, uh, we, we we hadn't been there that long, and people started to say, "Well, you're on top of the situation. How about a grog ration for the troops?" Uh, uh, uh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, pundits in the in the media put out the fact that I oh, know I'd uh, in Vietnam I'd seen the abuse of alcohol lead to a uh, indiscipline, a uh, death, uh, something. So I wasn't about to allow that. And I thought, no, no, you, you're missing the point. You c I couldn't get beer to everybody. So <laughs> I said, we're not going to stay back here in Dilly mm. having a beer ration when those poor so-and-sos, mm. cold, wet, tired, hungry, down on the border, mm. they can't get a beer. So only when I'm in a position to say, mm. You can have a beer too. Will we have a beer mm. back here? So, it, it, and you have to broadcast that. The often the harsh decision, or there will be a good reason. Mm. So leaders, they've got to make tough decisions wherever they can. Socialise the reasons. Mm. So, you're, you're saying, as you said, yeah, I'm cold, I'm I'm wet, I'm hungry, but we'll do the job. Yeah. And you know what happened when I said, we can have beers down on the border too. The boss down there said. We're down here to work, uh, we won't have beer, but when we get back to Dilly, we'll have beer. <laughs> Your and, call, mate. And from a corporate perspective, I, I've always been a fan, if you're gonna have bonuses, you have bonuses top to bottom yes. of a business. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, they're different bonuses and they're based on different performance issues, mm -hmm. but everybody's important and everybody, you know, wh why give the top few people? Success should have a thousand fathers. Mm. Yes. Or mothers. Or mothers, in yep. this case, or mothers. Look, I think you're right in this piece of the role of leaders in the workplace because we all, well, we yeah. began in a workplace where command and control was how we led. Yeah. And we are learning to evolve our leadership style to be inclusive but also um, be part of discussions that are happening in contemporary Australia today amongst leaders. There's actually a very good group uh, called the Me uh, Corporate Mental Health um, Alliance, Alliance mm. yes, who are a group of Australian business leaders who are working very hard to try and understand how to support their workplaces. Mm. But it's that fine balance, isn't it, between how do we support and how do we teach them to fish? Mm. Or how do we give them fish? And how, you know, wh where is that mm. line? Yeah. And we are uh, working really hard to try and understand at what, uh, you know, at what stage are we disempowering our people and what, you know, wh how do we help draw that distinction? Well, I, I always found that one of the things I, I loved to do was to be able to walk into a group of people in the Defence Force, any, any of the three services, uh, with a pocket full of congratulations to convey, promotions to make, good news to deliver, mm. to people doing it tough a long way from home. Mm. So uh, I, I, I like the idea of broadcasting joy, uh, real joy, not, not facile stuff. Uh, you know, you, you can't overstate mm. the impact of going in amongst a group of people who are at the coalface working extremely hard and elevating the morale of them by saying, you over there, you are doing a fantastic job. It's come to my attention. And they say, this old fella sitting in Canberra and he's 5,000 miles away in Afghanistan has just told me I'm doing a great job. I once promoted a fellow from corporal to sergeant in uh, Qatar. He was on a US headquarters, one of our fellas. And he was Mr. Every man. Everywhere I went on this headquarters, I kept getting told, your corporal so-and-so is a good bloke. And I'm getting told this by US generals. I rang Canberra and I said, uh, I'm, I'm here in Qatar and this corporal thingy has been doing a great job. I'm going to promote him, do the records. I walked into a big gathering and said, you're now a sergeant. 
I could not have chosen a better morale boost than to bring good wishes and outcomes to the shop floor. There's a, there's a wonderful quote from George W. Bush's eulogy at his father's funeral, yep. where he said, what are the people who work with you think about when, you, when you're gone? Yep. Do they think that you had the biggest house and the biggest car, or do they remember that you paused to share a word of friendship and ask after a sick child? Mm. And I thought, how eloquent because they'll remember the, that if they remember both, they'll always cherish the latter. Yeah. That'll be the thing, you know. He, he or she stopped. They asked after me, and those things don't take long. They don't. They take a, they take a fraction of a moment to ask after somebody. How's it going? And, and let them know you care. John, I have to tell an anecdote that connects to that. There was this wonderful commanding officer of the first battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment up in Townsville, 750 magnificent young fellows, and that that CO, uh, he had a an absolutely photographic memory. Yeah. So he's taken me around. By now I'm a, a, a colonel and I used to command that battalion. And I'm a bit jealous because <laughs> when this bloke walks around, he knew the name of every soldier. He knew their names. He knew their wives' names. Yeah. He knew about their kids. And he'd walk up to this soldier and I'd be there and he'd say, oh, Private Smith, how, how's, your, how's your wife? How's Nancy? How's that bad leg of hers? <laughs> oh, she's out of the moon. But yeah, what about the kids? They were going into the swimming carnival. Uh, and I'm blown away. I'm getting all this stuff. And it went on all day. So anyway, we're now in the officer's mess at the end of the day. And all of his officers are there. And we're having a beer. And uh, I said, well, gentlemen, I've been around today and I've been so impressed by Colonel Kelly and his, uh, his grasp of everybody's name. And I, I said, but I've worked it out. He told every soldier in the battalion that he'd be bringing the director of infantry, that was me, bringing the director of infantry around, and he was going to call me, call each soldier by a name, and whatever he said, <laughs> that was their name. Was their name. <laughs> and whatever he said about the wife, that was... <laughs> and, and they all laughed. Yeah. But really, what he was, was a leader connected to his yeah. people. Yeah. And that's doable yeah. in, you know, the benefit of technology is you can drop somebody a text, or yeah. you can pick up the phone on yeah. the way home. You can do a Zoom thing. Um, because, as you said, with distributed workforces, it's not easy. D during COVID, in my day job at Landcom, during COVID last year and COVID this year, we had um, our people and culture team contact everybody. Face-to-face, yep. -face, not on the phone. We wanted to see their face to see yep. how they're going. And some of them needed a bit more help. Others, So some conversations were five minutes, some were two hours. Yep. And it was just touching in with people at a difficult time. But the two-hour conversation may well have had the outcome of rehabilitating that. Yep. This is one of your workers, yep. isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, to get them back on the horse. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it, it, they can bounce back because, yeah. you know, they were they, they were dark times. I mean, I, you know, look, we've been through wars and people yeah. have died and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So this is different yeah. because, because of the nature of it. But it still needs the opportunity for people that talk and share and be, you say people are willing to talk to you, Sir Peter, it's a case of being able to be honest with you. Yeah, sure. And you, you look at the bottom line, which is always important when these things, keeping that person, that expert person uh, on the horses, I put it before, yeah. able to uh, extend uh, support to somebody may have saved several lives yeah, that otherwise no, would be lost. So uh, there is a direct outcome. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. We saw something really interesting in the Tokyo Olympic Games this year that yeah. were of course postponed from 2020 to 2021 this year. Um, a lot of young people who had primed themselves physically and mentally and their families and partners to have to sort of slide up and still uh, be primed and ready yeah. uh, for their biggest opportunity, their biggest mm. battle. And the realisation with Australian sport was that this wasn't going to happen if we didn't support them mentally as yeah. well as physically. And arguably, we had the very best mm. Olympic and Paralympic game outcomes we've had since Sydney. It was extraordinary. Mm, yep. And it was almost the first time we brought right to the front this business of let's talk about everybody's mental health. Mm. And on the return, when all of our athletes came back to Australia, the teams were prepared with from uh, the AOC, yeah. from the AIS, PACs, how to keep themselves for the two weeks they were on their own in isolation. Uh, mentally well, but mm. it's this business of if we look after ourselves mentally, all the other things we want to achieve in our life, whether it's run the quickest and well, be there. I want to chuck in one other thing. More than many of the other modern Olympics, because Tokyo uh, was a, will it take place, will they have crowds, 
they felt more standard bearers. They felt that they were special standard bearers because mm. nobody else was travelling yeah. and yeah. it was them. The only people sort of standing under our flag there mm. were our competitors. Mm. And I think that was special as well. I think mm. they were wonderfully supported by the Olympic movement. They were. But uh, they knew that there were 25 million people not travelling back in Australia saying, mm. go for it because mm. we can't. And, and the mental health challenge with sports people and others whose careers are over by and large um, by their 30s, exactly. you're going to live a long time after yeah. that. So yeah. how do you transition? And, and you know, you may or may not, you may have trained your whole life yeah. and got bronze that, yeah. that day, right? Mm. That day it all went wrong, you got bronze. Mm. Um, and you've trained, you know, from the age of 10, 12, 15 or something. So how we handle people's um, Trans careers, transitions, their mental health, is a real challenge and we see far too many examples of where it all goes wrong for people in that yep. situation and sport in particular, entertainment, you, know, you can be a star at 22 and not known at 25, right? So how we, how we deal with that particularly is quite important and uh, businesses play a big role in that. How do you, I mean I know you have that great connection with Sydney University Rugby Club, how maybe do you bring people through, how do you give them a career? Um, my, my son's in year 12, he's got a young bloke who's uh, uh, down to um, uni in Canberra and playing with the, uh, the rugby team down there. Mm. And they're giving him a degree as well as playing him in rugby. And I think that's clever. So from day one, they're saying, this is important, but so is that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you see, a lot, so, so it's very important that, that that transition and the rest of your life with people who have, um, Possibly you could say peak too early, but have careers that, th that their first career is over by their 30s. Mm. Yes. I think this business of um, mental agility, and I know, and there's a, there's a science of it, the neuroplasticity, and the, but this mental agility and allowing ourselves to be agile and open to what comes next um, is very difficult because if you're excellent at some, if you're an excellent um, high jumper mm. or you're an excellent, um, you know, accountant or you're an, at whatever it is, if that's lost to you, or you know, how, how do we move through any part of our lives? You know, we, we lose a partner when we're on our own. How do we continue to dust ourselves off and get up and move forward? I feel like that's more important now than ever. Well, all these things start with your smiling minds, minds program in the schools. They all mm. start young. You need you need kids to see flexibility in life, not just rigid rigidity, mm. and realise that things will change. Mm. Um, and because if they're just given a very rigid way of doing things, mm. um, they're not going to be prepared for something changing or something going wrong. Yeah, look, handling that transition from being the most, uh, one of the most elite mm. uh, and uh, easily recognised Australians during the pinnacle of your athletic career, in whatever the discipline is, to then uh, a relatively sharp mm. descent into something else. Not all of them get to uh, stay within sport doing other things or even in the public eye. It's a real transitional challenge. Mm. Uh, and uh, we're, I mean, our recent history is full of champions who've stumbled mm. yeah. in the aftermath. And uh, uh, it's, we're a fast moving society. I mean, uh, you might have been on the front page yesterday, you're in the fish and chips wrapper <laughs> the next day. Mm. So. Uh, and there's that old, uh, there's that old Latin tag, sic transit gloria mundi. So passes the glory of the world and you are now a feather duster. <laughs> you were a rooster, now you're a feather duster. Happens to governor generals as well. <laughs> but we need to build that in from the beginning. Yes. Because nobody's, well. Absolutely. There's, there's, you could count on a butcher's left hand the number of people who are going to have a career for 20 or 30 years yes. in that. So. How do we know from day one? Um, I know this sounds a little old fashioned and we've gone beyond this, but do you remember, I remember when, when I was a kid, uh, every, uh, every player for Balmain, uh, my old team, worked in the club as a cellarman yeah. or, or the council had them on the rubbish trucks. Remember that, the garbage yeah. trucks? And that was a long-term career. They That's carried right. on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they took, but they, they yep. gave them work in the yes. beginning. Yep. And the same applies in a number of areas, but yep. it's that ability that life's gonna change and you've gotta change with it, which, which is hard. People. No matter which way you cut it, we, we all say we love change. Many people hate change. Mm. <laughs> when you really drill down, they hate change because, you know, I've just got my life sorted out, everything's okay, and then bang, something changes. So um, change management anywhere, and I'm sure the military would have been a great example of this, change management is about the structures, 
Um, but it's also about how people mentally change with it. Because, mm. mm. you know, you might be able to do it. the new thing, but do you yeah. want to do it? Are you embracing it? Has it been explained to you properly? Are yeah. you going on the journey? Dame Mario Bashir was interviewed at one of your fabulous Lifeline lunches. I think it was a Charles Woolley who interviewed uh, her. No, it was no. Mike Munro. Mike Munro yeah. interviewed her. And I think he got one question in and she began on one of her most <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> stories where you could have heard a pin drop yeah. and like the very best interviewers. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't ask another question. He just yeah. folded his arms and Thanks sat back and yeah. she was really yeah. on a roll. But one of the things that she said that stayed with me was that this expectation that we put in our um, our own and our children's heads of, I just want you to be happy. Or this expectation that you should be happy all the time, whereas mm. a full life is actually, you know, if this is the uh, if this is the baseline of not feeling anything, mm. a full life is we're happy, we're sad, we're elated, yeah. we're, and some people have greater amplitudes of that Absolutely. happiness and sadness. Mm. Um, in particular, I think she focused on creative people, mm. you know, the artists and the writers and the people and the people who compose through their music and their storytelling, evoke joy and mm. sadness and. Um, that they are perhaps uh, you know have these higher amplitudes and and how we help celebrate not just the joy but you know also yeah. recognize that to have a full life we need yeah. to be down well, yeah. i say to people who i work with um uh look we all do things we don't really want to do if you've yeah. found a job where you can do everything you want to do can i come and work with you because <laughs> i'll be there tomorrow yeah. and it is a reality yeah. that not everything in life will make us happy there yeah. are some things that we yeah. have to do i mean there's a whole argument about whether you do things that are immoral and against yeah. your values. That's yeah. another argument. Mm. But we've all got to take the rubbish out. Nobody wants to take the rubbish out yeah. <laughs> on yeah. a Monday night in the middle of winter. Well, I've had a, a, a pretty interesting life, and and if I look back on it, some and might I, say that. Yeah. What do you reckon, John? <laughs> if I look, yeah, if I look back on it, and somebody said, "Well, you can have that life again," uh, uh, would you want to take out uh, all the yeah. sad bits? I'd say if I take out the sad bits, will I have that life? Yeah. And the answer would be no, yeah. because mm. you have to just cope with life. Mm. Uh, I, yeah, I feel I feel sorry for the person who says I just want you to be happy because they think that in saying that that yeah. that describes the end state. If I could put it that way, do something, feel happy. Do something, feel happy. Mm. Uh, maybe a better question is. What does you really want to do? Yeah. Do you know you're so right? Yeah. There's this thing, I reckon there's this Australian thing where we say to people, um, what, what job do you want? Not what are you good at or yeah. what do you like to yeah. think? What job do you want? Yeah. So we had this structure around yep. a job. Uh, just to, to echo what General Cosgrave said, you know, the people say to me, what's your great lesson of leadership? I said, failure. Mm. You know, it, and you, yeah. you know, what's the old rule? You, know, to, you, you can make a mistake once, you don't make it twice. That's but it, yeah. if you learn through failure, it makes you not bulletproof, but yep. gee, you're more hardened for, for life. And, uh, and it's a great way to remind you that you're an imperfect human <laughs> exactly. being. Exactly. And that whatever you're looking at, there are people struggling out there, well, don't think you're the one with all the answers. Yeah, yeah. Because by definition, as a human, uh, you are prone to failure. So it builds a bit of compassion into the exchange you might have with people. So never try to uh, pretend that you're the finished product as mm. a leader. <laughs> Great. I think you're right and these are important lessons even for us on sites as we run our uh, sites. Tony and I have been part of conversations over the years as you would have been I'm sure where um, our leaders will sometimes want to move somebody along if they've made a mistake or sure. done the wrong thing mm. and our question is always but now they've learnt one of those really important mm. life lessons and they've got that under their belt, do you really want to lose them now? Just let's have I, a think I, about that. I was a young staffer, political staffer, to a bloke called Ted Pickering, who was the police minister. And my job was, was pretty, I was at the entry level. So in those days, ministers actually signed letters rather than had junior people sign the letters. Mm. So two letters, had come, two groups had come in. The stuff that he just has to sign, he doesn't have to read it because it's pretty basic, you know. Do you sign so you didn't get off your parking ticket? Yeah. And then the more detailed stuff. And I made a mistake and put one letter in one file for him just to sign without reading. And it was um, quite offensive to a, lo a, a local community about, you know, basically it said, you're low income, of course, you're supposed to have more crime. So this made the local newspaper for a week and it was in Parliament and got to the end of the Thursday afternoon when Parliament finished and he called me, called me in and I fully expected to be yelled at or sacked. And he just said to me, please don't do that again. Mm. And it was the best lesson I've ever Learn in my life. And boy, did you understand what oh, that meant. <laughs> so he, didn't have to, he didn't have to say anything. Yeah, else. exactly. Yeah, but yeah. it was, please don't make that happen again. He said, I've been yeah. sick all week, you know, I've been shy. Mm. But play, and, and it was the was best it. lesson in leadership. Yeah, and in I've leadership. been able to use it myself. And mm. these are our lessons. Because 
I have to say here at Build Corp and in our uh, community su that support the Build Corp Foundation, we're all leading people in our own way or all trying to lead by example. Mm -hmm. And these lessons are, are really important for us. But I'd love you to wrap up for us with perhaps um, an example that you might be able to share with us or, or something that we might want to keep front of mind as we move forward, um, looking towards 2022. Um, something about ourselves because if we can elevate ourselves as leaders and ensure that we continue to remain tapped into our empathy as we lead um, to rebuild you know Australia and reimagine it the way we want to see mm. it again I suspect we went off off piste a little bit for a while and mm. we're looking for mm. yeah looking for that quick way forward uh, in a leadership journey from when you first start to lead uh, to you're no longer compass mentors enough to lead uh, that you're trying to acquire wisdom mm -hmm. uh, and that will come through study of course and, and experience and, and failure and success where you, you you strip success down to say who really got that success and uh, how close were we to failure so you all of that wisdom along the way uh, and that's accompanied by what I would say private self-analysis. I wanted to be every day as either the leader or introducing some levels of leadership as Governor General. As Governor General you don't lead anybody in particular but you use leadership type behaviour when you're engaging with the public. So with all of that to be my most uh, own harshest critic <laughs> so that I figure if I was you know, quietly scathing about things I'd done, I was much more likely to meet the hopes and expectations of the people by modifying, refining, improving my performance. So be a critic, uh, so be clear-eyed, take advice. My wife was always good at this. You know, when I we're refer. excellent yeah, as, yep, as yep. wives, we're great at that. Forgive yourself. Yeah and get on because uh, the, the leadership task will be there the next day and the next day and the next day. So as you know, you're being wheeled into the, uh, the aged care place and you say, no, no, you should go this way, you know, because <laughs> <You know? laughs> the leadership uh, responsibility will never lead you, leave you. Well, well I, I should tell you in my old electorate of Pittwater, there is a retirement village named after you. Yeah, there is. <laughs> there is yeah. Peter so, Cosgrove House. Peter Cosgrove there. House. Oh. Yep. Have you got a bed there? Is it? I'm told that it's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's available at the moment. But, <laughs> but, but I think, don't forget the lessons we learned. Yeah. We had, uh, and not everything was negative during COVID. I mean, yes. in Australia, we did incredibly yeah, well. I mean, we did. There, as we speak today in November, they're closing down Austria and yep. Holland and all of those places. Mm. So we, we did a lot right. Yeah, we did some things wrong. But I, I, when I was in politics, I remember winning, r ringing the state director of the Western Australian Liberal Party and they just lost an election. I said, tell me what you did right. Yeah, yeah <laughs> because you didn't do everything wrong. Tell me what you did right because all the focus will be is what did you do wrong? Yeah. What did you do wrong? So let's not walk out of here thinking, oh, if we've done this, if we've done that, if we've done that. Um, we shouldn't ignore the mistakes, but we, sh we did so much right. So let's work out some of that magic sauce. Mm. Uh, and, and as we were talking about earlier, suicide dropped by 5.4% in Australia in 2020. So when people were predicting a pandemic of suicide to go with a pandemic of, of, of COVID, it didn't happen. It went the other way. So what did we get right there? What did we get right in workplaces where people... Um, were looked after in communities where people were looked after. So just one small example, in, in where, where we live, there's a couple Nick, around, just two houses down from us, uh, Ray and Sylvia, who were in their 80s. And when COVID hit last year, we went around and the, the other neighbours said, no, no, we're doing their shopping for them. Don't worry, it's all sorted and we're leaving it at the door and all that. Now, we pro why don't we keep doing that? <laughs> why was that only a COVID thing? Um, and, and those are, you know, why, we shouldn't just go back to how it used to be. Let's learn some of those lessons. Uh, as, as Peter said, that made us an incredible country that looked after people and came to the fore in what we would call traditional Australian values. Yeah. Um, let's, let's work that out and let's keep that. Let's not go back to how it used to be. I mean, there's that simple statement, I am my brother's keeper. Yeah, that's right. And we should uh, uh, not uh, ascribe that to any particular religious 
uh, approach, just to say that's what neighbours do. Yeah. It won't surprise anybody who tunes in to listen to this lovely conversation that you've been so generous to have with us today, why we feel so privileged to have um, access to not just you, but to your examples, the both of you, and to your leadership. And we all aspire to be able to lead the way you do with empathy and courage and be able to, you know, conduct our own self-examination, mm -hmm. but be kind enough on ourselves to be able to use that well as we uh, lead our teams and our people and our communities on the way forward. So thank you so much for your time. You do your own bit of leadership. Don't forget about that uh, <laughs> here at the Bill Corp Foundation. So thank you and, for that. Well, and, th and thank you again. And it's such an enormous privilege to have you agree to be our patron. So Peter Cosgrove, thank you very much. John Brogdon AM, thank you so much for your leadership and time.